Andrew Gooley from the Strand Magazine, and I'm with uh, Tess Gerritsen, uh, one of the contributors to No Rest for the Dead. I'm Tess Gerritsen, an author, and I'm one of the contributors to No Rest for the Dead. So, Tess, when I contacted you and asked you to be a part of this, uh, what were you thinking? Besides that I was crazy, of course, which you know. <laughs> <laughs> which I knew. I thought it sounded like a lot of fun. I had never taken part in a serial novel before. Uh, I was also a little concerned about how difficult it would be because I was jumping in writing a little section, not knowing what had come before that, uh, and trying to make it all integrated into one uh, story that would make sense. Uh, but it um, it sounded like fun, and it ended up uh, having a great number of uh, terrific writers. So what excited you about your part in the book? I'll never forget when I showed you the complete arc for No Rest, uh, no Rest for the Day, when you said, you said, I have to do the diary. And you were so adamant on that. And I said, you know what, Tess is doing the diary because she feels so strongly about this. Yeah, I I wanted a chance to delve into uh, the dead woman's head. I wanted to find out what she was thinking. Um, I wanted uh, maybe to, to go a little more deeply into her psychology and why she would want her husband killed. Uh, and it was a perfect way for me to, to sort of jump into this middle-aged woman's um, point of view and the stresses she was under and why she hated her husband and, and the ways that he had made her feel so insignificant. So um, I chose it because it was, I think, more of an interior chapter. And you did a great job with that. Uh, so how did it feel to work on something without a character that you created? Because you're you're... Your works are very character driven. Well, that's why I uh, I love doing this particular chapter um, because I don't think there are any other chapters that really told much from from Rosemary's point of view. Uh, a lot of it was uh, takes place after she's already been executed. Um, so there are a lot of other characters whose motivations are explored. But here is the central character in the story. Did she kill her husband? That was the real question. I wanted to focus just on character, and that's what I was able to do without, without too much um, you know, worrying about, does this action work, or um, is this going to fit into the plot? I just want to know who she is. So how did the whole uh, project turn out to you? <laughs> I thought it turned out uh, surprisingly. It did. It did come out to be something that um, that hung together. I think this kind of a of a project has a lot of you know. There's a lot of things that could go wrong. Part of the problem is that we are so many different writers. We all have our own way about you know how we would approach a story. And I noticed that when I got to my section, which was, as I said, about two-thirds of the way through, I still didn't know who did it. I still didn't know how this was all going to work, and I still didn't know what all the different motivations were. Um, it was everything from you know, some kind of art theft to personal, and I thought, well, my job here is to try and start to tie it together because it was sort of late in the story already. That was an interesting thing where you – you were able to add a bit of a twist to the diary, which I think was something that, despite being a very interior, introspective uh, section of the uh, story, what you managed to do was to just twist it in a very interesting way. You must have been thinking that, hmm, this is going to be something interesting for the person who writes their chapter <laughs> after mine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was thinking of I was trying to make your your life easier too because <laughs> um I felt at that point I, things weren't coming together yet. We were focused a lot on the art section, you know, whether it was art was an important part of the reason for having killed her husband. And that was not as interesting to me as things that have to do with personal lives. I was most interested in the point of view of a woman who's been betrayed by her husband. You know, that's I think I always go for the emotional section, the part that really punches you in the gut. And that, from a woman's point of view, has the most emotion. You know, Why do you hate your husband? And how did it feel to discover that he's been unfaithful to you? I just wanted to use that as one of the motivations. Yeah, the interesting thing that you explore the old Dostoevskian theme of the passive guilt, and that, that's what I really liked about it, where in her diary she's not exactly confessing as much as 
admitting that she may have had a passive involvement. And that's what I found is very, very interesting. It made listeners really think back about the whole thing. Yeah, well, that was part of my assignment, I believe, which was that she would confess she was innocent. Exactly, um, exactly. Yeah. Have a bit of a passive, you know, perhaps a bit of a, you know, feeling that she might have had a small responsibility, which is very interesting. Who was your favorite character? Was it the villain? Was it Rosemary? Who would you say was your... Well, obviously it was Rosemary. <laughs> Since I was the one who got to write from her point of view, I loved being able to dig into, um, you know, into a woman who's my age, you know, who's, who's somebody I could really identify with. Well, you have a great husband. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I haven't killed him yet. <laughs> you have not killed him yet. Oh, he's a, he's a very nice guy. He does not deserve to be killed. <laughs> So did did you enjoy being part of a team of 26 uh, different authors, or was the experience in a way almost a little jarring that people are going to pick up on what you had worked on and, you know, pass their own unique twist to it? Well, I did feel a lot of pressure knowing that what I did would either make it really hard <laughs> or make it a little easier for whoever came after me. The way the the project came about was that, you know, we were writing pretty much se sequentially. Mm -hmm. So I could not write until everybody ahead of me had, had finished their part. And I knew that what I put in there could either be, uh, you know, throwing a screwdriver into the whole thing and screwing up the machinery, or uh, I could be oiling the machinery. And I was trying very hard to be, you know, the one who was oiling the machinery to make it work. Um, what I liked about it was to see all the different kind of styles, you know, the, the, the way that we all worked differently, um, the way we tried to make this work as one whole, and yet you could hear the voices that were different. You could hear that some people like to do action, some people like to do um, maybe more interior stuff, such as, you know, my chapter, and some people were clearly there to be organizers, to make the story hang together. Yeah, that's a funny thing. In fact, I was interviewed by a rather small newspaper in Oklahoma, and they they were saying, like, what is this like to put, to, get, to, to put something like this together? And I said, well, it's sort of in communicating with the writers that every chapter has to be important, but that every chapter cannot be the pivotal, most pivotal chapter of the story. And that really helps because I know I've, been, I've heard of other serial novels where you can get 13 bodies in 13 chapters. That doesn't seem very realistic. <laughs> no, no, it it isn't, and you know we we're all vying for attention. <laughs> I I I don't know how you do it. I think it's I think the hardest part is from the editor's um, you know perspective is how do you handle all these multiple egos who each want to you know outshine the other one, uh, who each want to write the pivotal chapter, who each want to put in um, the plot twist that's going to kill every, every other plot twist. It's hard to be a ringmaster, um, and I, I still don't know how you did it. Well, you have to be sweet and somewhat influential at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> somewhat, yeah. I guess you were somewhat influential. <laughs> the, the audio book recently hit number one on iTunes, and, which, is, which is great news. And the audio book production was fantastic. I mean, I found nuances in the story that I, had not, I could not detect even by reading the book about 5,000, maybe 10,000 times. I think in the previous interview I said I read it 300, but no, I think it's more. But anyway, tell us about the importance of the oral storytelling as far as thrillers are concerned. You know, I think oral storytelling is, is really more difficult because of thrillers, um, because thrillers move so quickly, because plots tend to be very complicated, and if you are tuning out, <laughs> you, you might have missed an important clue. So um, there's a challenge to doing a good audiobook of a thriller. On the other hand, that's the way stories have been told to the centuries. So um, what I love when I sit down and, and listen to a good thriller, and usually this happens when I'm in the car, uh, when I'm driving a long distance and I just want to be entertained, I love an audiobook that, that gets me, you know, sucks me into the person, um, the narrator, the people who are involved, uh, the main character. I, I really love somebody whose voice I feel uh, could be mine. And Tess, you're of uh, you know Chinese heritage of, from your, your family, and you once told me an interesting thing in that they're not novels. The novel form is not strong over there. 
Is that right? Yeah. And it, it, it's interesting, yeah. You find that there's more of a tradition of oral storytelling there since the, no, the written novel form is not very strong and, and influential yet. I think that the, the traditional storytelling in China has been through poetry. I mean, there are some many, many great poets there, um, and through, through art, through visual art, such as painting. But the novel, such as you'd find, say, in, you know, or storytelling, the kind of storytelling you'd find, say, in, in Ireland or something, it just doesn't seem as powerful. I think that Chinese just have a different way of conveying stories. I'm not sure I would say that they have an oral tradition, but they certainly have a musical tradition and a poetic tradition. Exactly. So it's more of a, it's more of a musical way of coming up with plots. And I just yes, have to yes. say it was incredible that when I first came up with this whole project, the first two people I emailed were you and John Lesquois. And you <laughs> replied back immediately saying, I'm in Andrew, because you knew it was all for a good cause since all the money is going to the Leukemia Lymphoma Society. And that was just incredible because you two were the sort of the first two bricks by which the whole thing was built upon. <laughs> you were the foundation. <laughs> Well, I hope it helped. It made it easier for you to recruit because I know these um, these collections uh, are sometimes really hard to get writers to to come aboard for. Uh, you know, we're all strapped for time. We're all not quite sure whether this is going to work. And you know, we need to be able to trust the editor, and we need to be able to trust whoever's behind it. Hi, I'm Tess Garrison, and one of the contributors to No Rest for the Dead. My chapter is the chapter with Rosemary's diary, and I hope you enjoy it. Belle could feel her heart thumping hard. What secrets lay inside? What Pandora's box was she about to open? The last entry is from August 22nd, 2000. She paused, looked up. The day before she was executed. Read it, Olson said. Belle swallowed hard and began to read. I have become the invisible woman. I don't know the precise moment when it happened, when I began to fade from view like the Cheshire cat, my face dimming until only the ghost of my smile remains. I think it must have started soon after Layla was born. That's when I first noticed that Christopher no longer seemed to look at me, but instead looked through me, as if I had turned transparent. Once your husband stops looking at you, you begin to feel that the rest of the world has stopped looking as well. There was a time when I could catch a man's eye just by wearing a short skirt and high heels. I could walk into a gathering of state historians and see the startled looks on their faces when they realized that the arms and armor curator was an attractive young woman. And I was attractive. The Rosemary, who once was, confident and serene, ready to love and be loved. That woman is gone now. In her place is a woman whom no one seems to see, a woman who walks into rooms unnoticed and unacknowledged. In this, I am not alone. This is what the passage of time does to all women. It thickens our waists, streaks our hair with gray, crinkles the skin around our eyes. But invisibility also has its uses. I certainly found it useful that summer. On this, my final evening on earth, I don't know why I should be focused on that particular memory. Over the past weeks, I have been reviewing my life, remembering all my bad choices, all the points in time when a wiser decision could have sent me on a path toward a different and happier fate. But this is the fate I am now locked into, and I can't help thinking about one of those crucial points in time. That day in June, when I walked into the lobby of the Coronado Hotel. That was the day... My future was sealed. It was not my first visit to that grand old hotel. Years before, as a newlywed, 
I had strolled through the lobby in a sundress and had seen a bellman stare admiringly at my legs. But this time, when I walked in, no one looked at me. I was just a mousy, brown-haired matron in a shapeless shirt and slacks, scarcely worth a glance when there were other females to stare at, young females who still had the glow of youth. They hadn't lost their figures to motherhood. Their shoulders weren't bowed from the humiliations of marriage to Christopher Thomas. It's as if I am there now. I watch one of those magnificent specimens walk past me in the lobby. She has shiny hair and perfect skin and the stride of a woman who knows she is beautiful. Enjoy it while you can, honey, I think, because some day you'll be where I am, exactly where I am. I hunch deep in a chair, and the woman doesn't see me as she walks past into the cocktail lounge, but I can see her perfectly. I see her glide across to the bar counter. I see her tap the shoulder of a man seated there. He turns, smiles at her, and reaches an arm around her waist to pat her ass. It is a gesture of easy familiarity, the way a man might greet his wife. The problem is, that man's wife is me. I watch as the shiny-haired woman and Christopher leave the cocktail lounge and stroll hand in hand to the grand stairway. They are too wrapped up in their lust. They don't notice me follow them up the two flights of stairs into the historic section of the hotel. They head down a charming but creaky hallway and disappear into a guest room. The door closes, and I hear the privacy lock click shut. I cannot help myself. I stand outside the room and imagine what's going on behind the closed door. I picture the clothes strewn on the floor, the naked bodies on the bed. I picture my husband's hands on that woman's silky young body, a body that has not given him two children and a decade of devotion. Why did I torment myself that way? Why did I follow him? when I already knew the purpose of his trip. Not business, as he'd claimed. No, it's never about business. After all the women I've had to suffer through, I knew exactly what he was up to whenever he'd disappear for a few days, or even for just a few hours. Suddenly, standing outside the room, I can bear it no longer. I leave that closed door and walk out of the building to the garden courtyard. There, I call the only person I can call about this. I have little regard for him, but at least in this case, his interests are aligned with mine. Mm -hmm.